Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Ehana Kako. What that means is let's work together. That's the name of our weekly program here on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're going out from the beautiful Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu to across the world. And so I say welcome and aloha. And if you don't happen to be in Hawaii, well, we want you to know about us and come build our economy with us and we'll go to you and build your economy with you. You know, we look at important movers and shakers when we come together on the Ehana Kako program. Program. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of Grassroot Institute, and my guest today is a man who is a true Hawaiian treasure. Uh, he's stood for and with and amongst the Hawaiian people here in Hawaii and amongst all people as someone who believes in what the Aloha spirit really stands for, somebody who has promoted the economy, the welfare, the society that are here in these Hawaiian islands. I'm proud to know him and have known him for many years, being in a sense uh, mentored by him to some extent, a beneficiary of what he has stood for. The man I'm talking about is Oswald Stender. He's a trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and he has been involved in the highest levels of business and public, well, in service to the community here in the islands. He's been with the Campbell Estate, the Hawaiian Electric, and numerous boards. But perhaps uh, most people know that he was a trustee of the Bishop Estate during a very significant time in which the Bishop Estate, the Kamehameha Schools, were transformed in terms of their leadership and the role that they play in these islands. Today we're not going to pull any punches. We're, we're going to look at real issues that I think most people in Hawaii care about and most people coming to Hawaii need to know about as well. But often there's much confusion. Oh, what is the very essence of the issues involving Hawaiians, non-Hawaiians, Hawaiians by blood, Hawaiians at heart? Uh, if we are all truly one people in the Aloha spirit, how should we conceive of ourselves? Uh, how do we look at the advancement of the native Hawaiian people and in the future? The institutions that Oswald Stender has been part of are really at the heart of this movement, whether it's Bishop of State Kamehameha Schools or today the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. But let me tell you this, although we're going to take a look at issues such as where the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is now and where it's going, we're going to take time also to look at the man, Oswald Stender somebody who has true aloha, somebody who has dedicated his life to service as opposed to the pursuit of profit. And with that said, I want to, to welcome my guest to the program. Uncle Oz, thank, thank you. you so much for being here today. Aloha. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm so glad. Uh, you know, all these years you've been so supportive of what I've done. and you have done great things you know, with the young kids. Yeah. Well, you know, you've had this heart for the keiki, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, Uncle Oz, this is your last term, I believe, that you've announced as a trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Let me just, just ask what you see uh, in, in your life as you continue to serve in, in the public eye. Well, I think, uh, you know, my, my mission at OHA, I, uh, when I gave it some thought as to should I or should, should I not uh, try to seek the office of trustee for uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, I, I felt that there was a sense of, for me, mission, because the mission of OHA as I saw it was to improve the quality of life of our Hawaiian people. Yes. And I knew about all the statistics that were so bad and that I was hopeful that I could make a difference. And, uh, and that's where I launched my uh, campaign to get involved. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I, I was successful in getting elected. This is my 13th year. That's right. Next year will be 14 years. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I will be leaving at the end of my term next year. And uh, I hope, I hope that I left it in a place better than it was when I found it. Well, you've done some significant things, not just in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, but as a trustee of the Bishop of State Kamehameha Schools and in other roles. And so this is mm -hmm. a continuity, really, uh, of a single mm -hmm. career. You know, before we, we later on talk a little bit about some of your career accomplishments, let's tell the folks out there who are viewing uh, what the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is. Mm -hmm. it, because we, we don't have this type of governmental entity in any other state. Yeah. It's a very special thing here in the state of Hawaii. Well, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was created by the Constitutional Convention of 1978. That's right. And the reason for that was, upon statehood, 
the United States government returned to the state of Hawaii uh, 1.2 of the 1.8 million acres yes. that were ceded to the United States government back in uh, annexation, which is 1898. So this is what we call typically <coughs> the ceded lands, the, ceded lands. The, the lands which had come from the then right. Kingdom of Hawaii right. that the federal government of the United States took custody of right. and transferred to the state of Hawaii upon statehood in right. 1959. <coughs> right. And it, it, um, the ceded lands transferred to the United States government was 1.8 million acres and what was returned to the state of Hawaii was 1.2 million. Now, people always wonder about the other sure, 600, 6 million. And 200,000 of that is Hawaii homes. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is Pearl Harbor, Hickam, all the military bases uh, throughout Hawaii. Now, some of these lands happen to be <coughs> where we have the airport located or the university located. Right. And so part of the purpose of, of these lands was to provide revenues, a revenue stream right. for the the Hawaiian people, both in a, the native Hawaiian sense, but in the broader sense of, of providing for utilities, public uh, use right. of lands, yeah, and so forth, lands for everyone. Were, yeah, right. The lands that were, that were returned to ceded land, uh, the earnings from those lands are to serve five purposes. And, and those you already mentioned, and the fifth uh, benefit was uh, for the betterment of the lives of Hawaiians, very now, broad. Now let me count those through. In fact, you know, a lot of lawyers that I know don't like yeah. to say five purposes. <coughs> they like to say that, that there was this this uh, intention, right? And they do name five things within right. it. One is certainly to to provide for uh, education right. in Hawaii, and that's mm -hmm. why we have the university right. and public schools built on some of that right. land. Mm -hmm. And others, utilities and, mm -hmm. and things that the public need, right. the management of public lands and so right. forth. Mm -hmm. And you, even to some extent, uh, helping people out uh, with farms and agriculture right. and business. That was part of it. But you mentioned one very clear um, item, which is the welfare and benefit of the native Hawaiian that's people. Right. That's right. And I think that's probably what you're focusing on when you're talking that's about right. the mission of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. That's right. And that's what we do. You know, our, uh, our effort day by day is to improve the quality of life of Hawaiians. And as you know, the Hawaiians are mostly, uh, you know, overrepresented in, uh, in prison, on welfare, education, uh, you name it, substance abuse. And so we find, at least my interpretation is, we need to reverse those statistics mm. and make life better for the clients. You know, uh, a few weeks ago, we, were, we had the opportunity to have Trustee Peter Apo with us. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. he expressed so wonderfully one of the values I know you hold, and, and that is that we as Native Hawaiians are also other ethnic groups too. Right, right. Uh, I think Trustee Apo said, most of us Hawaiians are also mostly something else. Yes, that's right, that's right. So, so my only concern is sometimes when we look at the statistics mm -hmm. of Hawaiians who are incarcerated or who, mm -hmm. whose health is poor because mm -hmm. of the lifestyle they must right, live and so right. forth, mm -hmm. sometimes we also forget that they are also Filipino uh, Portuguese, Caucasian, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth, yeah. because we've always been a people who've mixed. Right, right. And, and so, do you think sometimes so, well, we can overstate how bad off we are and even forget how well off many Hawaiians, thanks to your work yeah. at Kamehameha mm -hmm. Schools, mm -hmm. are, are? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, the ethnicity issue, uh, you know, we keep getting caught up in this quantum sure. issue, mm -hmm. and it all began with uh, the um, uh, Hawaiian homes, and that's where it began. Now, just to clarify for our viewers, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, this is a completely different entity from right. the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, right. and it actually began during the territorial years. Right. Uh, we, we go back to the 1920s, right. the establishment of a Department of Hawaiian mm -hmm. Homelands. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the fundamental purpose there, to take some of those ceded lands so that there could be residences for Native Hawaiians? Well, uh, Jonah Guhio had mm -hmm. this idea that the rehabilitation of Hawaiians begins with the land. Yes. The Hawaiians mm -hmm. always were farmers, and that was their, uh, and uh, the fact that these lands were taken from them 
we need to return some of them so they can return to agrarian form of lifestyle. And that was the whole idea. So the Hawaiian homes was to create lands for Hawaiians not only to, uh, to live on, but to farm. Yeah, so it, it, it helps individuals <laughs> in possession of land yeah. to be able to become autonomous and, and self-supporting and, right. and independent. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this question because it's a, often a controversial question, mm -hmm. but uh, and I want to get back to our main point about mm -hmm. Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Mm -hmm. The lands provided by <coughs> the Department of Hawaiian Homelands mm -hmm. are leased to Hawaiians, right. and uh, certain blood quantum, as you mentioned earlier, right. is mm -hmm. necessary for them mm -hmm. to be able to acquire them, or even a blood quantum is necessary for them to pass them on to their heirs. Yeah, exactly. What is this, the, the thinking behind leasing the land as opposed to allowing people to have the land fee simple? Well, the problem with having, you know, transferring, uh, this has been discussed many times, mm -hmm. why don't they have the Hawaiians own the, these lands in fee? Well, the problem is they'll get into the marketplace, then they'll lose it all because people will sell them and they'll sell them to non hawaiians uh, the leasehold system at least controls and manages the process so they could never alienate the land from the people. Hmm. Is this thinking along the lines that different cultures were coming together, one culture that did not practice private land ownership mm -hmm. and another culture that, that did and that yeah. the Hawaiians could be taken advantage of? Well, you know, the Hawaiians, mm -hmm. when they lived at the time of the kingdom, uh, had no idea what it was uh, to own land is foreign to them. And so when, when Hawaii was colonized and the land started to transfer from the kingdom to other fee ownership, uh, the Hawaiians were left out of it because they had no idea what that was mm -hmm. all about. Well, you know, one of the things that I have always appreciated <coughs> in learning from you and bringing groups of young people mm -hmm. is you've always you, in, inspired young Hawaiians to get out there and make it in the marketplace. That's right. <laughs> Just as you That's have right. as a trustee mm -hmm. of Campbell Estate right. or mm -hmm. a board member of the Hawaiian Electric and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, I was so surprised when I met a former politician. I won't even tell you what party mm -hmm. or what mm -hmm. office or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, were, we were talking. We had lunch together. Mm -hmm. and, and he addressed the same issue. Mm -hmm. And he's part Hawaiian. And he said, you know, Kili, if our people got the land, you know, we're not smart like other people. Mm -hmm. We would lose the land. Mm -hmm. And then my, my heart just kind of felt a stab there. Mm -hmm. He meant well. Mm -hmm. He has aloha. Mm -hmm. But I didn't hear from him the kind of thing I often hear from you which is we have to educate ourselves. Right. We have to achieve right. in the marketplace. Right. So my question is this, do you think that today conditions are different, that, that Hawaiians could take land, fee simple, and, and some will lose it perhaps, but at least be empowered to be in the marketplace I as competitors with Hawaiians others? Hawaiians who have done well mm -hmm. in the fee simple land market, <clears throat> but Many of Hawaiians have no idea how to manage that process. And so until they do, and it's all a matter of education. Okay, that's, and, that's know, very big for you, education. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, that's the salvation of Hawaiians, is it, to be educated. Hmm. You know, I tell a story about, you know, these two Hawaiians pushing in this wagon uphill with square wheels. In the wagon were round wheels. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't know what to do with it. There you go. And so education would have told them what to do with it. So when we put the, the bigger picture together mm -hmm. and bring education in as the means by which empowerment and achievement mm -hmm. can, can be secured by Hawaiians, mm -hmm. That changes then the institutions, Absolutely. because with the right kind of education of a people, mm -hmm. it's not necessary to, to shepherd them, so to speak. That's it's right. not necessary mm -hmm. to be their parents and mm -hmm. say, you can only lease this. Yeah. 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 You, know, you know that that one of the values that I'm working for nowadays mm. <laughs> is, is the value of, of personal property rights. Right. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, I just think, and we we'll just wonder how you feel, wouldn't it be more wonderful to see Hawaiians be able to operate with their personal property rights and compete in the marketplace and gain the education they need to, that's, to do uh, that? In my right. view, that's a preferred route. Mm -hmm. you know, but you need to educate them. You know, until you do that, uh, the Hawaiians are at a disadvantage. Well, well thank you for 
letting us kind of parse this issue out a little broader than it usually mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these things are, all, are black and white. Yeah. And we don't bring in a very important factor, one which you have stood for, mm -hmm. and that is the education of the people right. is what makes all the difference. It makes a whole lot of difference. Unfortunately, you know, the Hawaiians haven't caught up yet. Mm. You know, Kamehameha right. only touches maybe 5% of the uh, enrollment in, public, in, in the school system. And yet, the rest of these Hawaiians are not giving, given the quality of education that Kamehameha can provide for them. Well, we'll come back and we'll continue mm -hmm. talking about the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. My guest today is Trustee Oswald Stender, who has distinguished himself in his service to <coughs> Hawaiians by blood and Hawaiians at heart. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. You're watching Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Come back and we're going to deal with some very important issues. Aloha. I'm Nicole Hori for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone number nine has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. <coughs> <laughs> Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kei'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. We're going to pick up again with a tremendous man who has served our community so well, Trustee Oswald Stender of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. As he shared in our first segment, uh, this is his final full year as a trustee because in 2014 he does not intend to seek re-election. I'm sure that there will be some exciting things that he'll be doing beyond that as well. But uh, we're here to be able to pick his brain and to hear his heart uh, on some important issues. If, if you have really not uh, in the past uh, been able to come up to speed on issues regarding uh, what it is to be in a community where there were people living before we were uh, the United States and to look at the integration of all people together, well, Oswald Stender is one of the experts who really knows about that, and he's lived that. And so we're going to just go back and continue mm -hmm. with our, our discussion. Mm -hmm. Uncle Oz, uh, you know, I've always known you in the, your capacity, in a broad sense, as an educator, mm -hmm. whether you were uh, you're teaching yourself or whether you were actually <clears throat> administering mm -hmm. institutions that, that mm -hmm. were distributing education. Mm -hmm. And so you know today that another part of the story, as we were talking about in the break, is that Hawaiians are also among some of the highest achievers uh, in, in, in our state, such as yourself and, and many others who've gotten fabulous educations, mm -hmm. who have served in business, who've served in government and so forth. Why do you think that story doesn't seem to be told as, as much? Only because there's not enough of us out there. Uh. There's not enough who are highly educated, high achievers, and we need to get more and more Hawaiians educated and become high achievers. And that's, that's why the story is not told. Um, I don't know what you do other than to continue to encourage Hawaiians to go beyond high school. Uh, this week and last week, we went throughout the community to try to encourage kids in high school that there are opportunities to go to college. Cost is a factor, but there's money out there that they could mm. uh, they can access well, in, uh, and get on to get a higher education. And, and High school education, not good enough. Yes. Well, you've certainly done a lot in helping to promote education. You know, as we return to the subject of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, mm -hmm. uh, one of the stated purposes of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is to ho'olu la hui aloha, or to help build or restore a, a beloved kingdom, right. or nation, really, right. in the sense. Mm -hmm. And yet you have some, some uh, deep thoughts uh, about yeah. how maybe that mm -hmm. statement can be taken the wrong way. And, and I know you've taken yeah. some, some stands, uh, yeah. some bold stands yeah. in the midst of the other trustees. Throughout these years, um, I mean, of course, the Kaka Bill was mm -hmm. the first, uh, I guess, effort in trying to build this nation. And uh, just seeing what happened then, seeing what happened with 
uh, Kalaiwa Balu to... Which is the Native Hawaiian role. The role commission, what's happened there, to see what happened to uh, the efforts of, that OHA has tried to uh, create this sense of building this uh, beloved nation. I find, and it's my own feeling, that there are not enough Hawaiians who really believe or want to spend the time at it. You know, I think most Hawaiians, at least the Hawaiians that I know, you know, are perfectly satisfied to live under the current government structure that they mm -hmm. have now. Now, is that necessarily a, a bad thing? Could Hawaiians achieve for their families and as individuals advancement, uh, yeah. even w within the framework of, of the government yeah. as it is now, the United mm -hmm. States of America? I think that's where Hawaiians want to be. Okay. I think most Hawaiians want to be there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm probably a minority on the board that think that way, uh, but it, it's very difficult for me to understand why over these last 10 years that I've been involved in trying to get Hawaiians to register so that we can find them to build this new nation. Now, you're referring to a process that has had three informal registrations right. to have people sign up with, with, with no legal status per se, we but had, at least... We had the Hawaii Registry, uh -huh. we had Kauinoa, yes. and Kanaiolo. Right, and the third, however, according to our state legislature, Act 195 mm -hmm. of Session 2011, mm -hmm. creates an actual official registry. Right. and. As you've shared with me, very few people have signed up, and sure. and you've come to the conclusion th that that perhaps that's not a value or an interest of Hawaiian people at large. That's 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 my opinion. Because if we have five hundred thousand Hawaiians in this country, mm -hmm. why is it only a hundred thousand have signed up, and many of those are under eighteen? So. Where are the adults that are supposed to make the difference? Now you took, you took a very bold move this year, uh, g going public, or at least at the, the Board of Trustee meetings, mm -hmm. making it known that, that you felt that continued pursuit of an enrollment process to set up a distinct political nation of Hawaiians mm -hmm. is at the very least not something uh, of what it's not e it's not even cost effective and it's okay. poor stewardship of money so you led the charge to have the office of Hawaiian Affairs stop funding this stop process funding. Because, you want to tell us a little yeah. about that yeah I uh, you know I from the very beginning I had an issue with it because if you go back to uh, uh, what we had done up to that point there was not enough people interested enough to sign up and to spend four million dollars to find 20,000 people out of 500,000, to me, that, there's a message there that's telling me they're not interested. Mm -hmm. The Hawaiians are not interested. So why, sh why do we continue to keep doing it? Well, why do you think that is? That, and because this isn't a new message. That this has been I the consistent people are result. I people who are passionate about it. At the leadership level. At the leadership level. And they're very passionate about it, and they're going to keep trying to mm -hmm. get it done. I think uh, what Kaneo Luwalo has done, okay, we've got that list. Why don't we carry forward from that list going forward and have that group of people who are interested enough to, uh, to participate, have them describe this government or this form of governance sure. that they want. Let them build, build on it and see whether other people would join it. When you and I were talking a little bit earlier uh, upstairs at the Plaza Club, we, you, you said something that really uh, rang true, I felt. Uh, it, 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 it was that we don't need to create another branch of government. Right. over people. Do you, do you want to say yeah. some things about that? I like to think I'm a practical person, <laughs> you know, and I'm very uh, conscious of how we spend OHA's money. Office uh, of Hawaiian Affairs. That's right, and I think we need to be always conscious of that money's not ours and should be wisely spent. So <coughs> I was against spending any more money because it wasn't getting the results that was intended. And so with that said, why do we persist on doing it? That was my problem. Mm. And, uh, you know, I know that 
you know, others who were very passionate about it and, and wanted to see it uh, go forward, but I just couldn't see it myself. You know, there have been efforts where government has been involved in a very big way in <coughs> administering entitlements mm -hmm. to Hawaiians, managing the affairs mm -hmm. of Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. And one example is the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've had a vantage point of being able to see this year how much um, impropriety, mm -hmm. some levels of corruption, mm -hmm inefficiency at the, at, at the very least ha have pervaded that process and, and it's not really accomplished its mission. Is, is this characteristic of what happens when we build government entities? Uh, yeah, uh, OHA's got a, got a problem with that. We're a government agency and yet we, and we need to operate under a government agency, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, performa. But the problem is government is very inefficient. I mean, so when people talk about building a new government, why do you want to build a government when it's high cost to maintain it and governments around the country are going broke? So to <laughs> me, I'm saying, you know, maybe now, well, surely now is not the time. And so there are other issues we ought to be working on rather than trying to build this government that's not going to work. You know, an interesting phrase came, and I'm not attaching it to you or any trustee in particular, but in three editions ago of the uh, Kavai Ola, the official newspaper mm -hmm. of, of OHA, I think I mentioned to you uh, during a break, there was an interesting opening ed editorial in mm -hmm. which it said the purpose of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is to restore the rights and powers of the monarchy. Right. And, and I just kind of chuckled because I, I don't take that as a legal statement. It's mm -hmm. not in your charter, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. But but what do you think might have been meant by that? And, and what are your thoughts about that kind of uh, rhetoric? Uh, you know, it's a statement that doesn't make any sense at all because we are sovereign. Mm -hmm. The Hawaiians are a sovereign nation. The problem is Nobody recognizes it. Mm. You know, uh, it not been taken away. The people have not given it up. So Keanu Sai, who took this issue all the way to the World Court, proved it, and the World Court uh, accepted his his thesis that yes, the Hawaiians are sovereign, but they also said unless other people, other nations, recognize that, it doesn't mean anything. So. In the way you've just put it, that unless other nations recognize it, it has no meaning. Mm -hmm. The kind of sovereignty you're talking about is 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 a self-identification. Right. It, it's something that individuals in of any kind of background can mm -hmm. assert. Mm -hmm. We are this. Nobody mm -hmm. can take that away from a people. Right. The self-determinism. Right. But what you point out is that we live in a world community, right. in, in which we need our neighbors to recognize That's right. that we are a certain way. That's right. So that's the plight, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a complex issue, yeah. you know, Uncle it, is it, it really is, very because very. What, what's really being affirmed here is that no one can deny the self-determinism of any people mm -hmm. to assert who they are right. and what they are. Right. But in the real world, and you could say you're a pragmatist, mm -hmm. we, have to rec we have to realize it takes other people to recognize that's right. what we are. And for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that most of the Hawaiians I know are, are not actually opposed to this concept. Mm -hmm. We are also Americans. Mm -hmm. And with that, we have the Bill of Rights, we have the Constitution, mm -hmm. we have the economic opportunity, mm -hmm. and so forth. So mm -hmm. am I hearing you say that it's time, instead of pursuing nationhood politically, mm -hmm. it's time to pursue practical means by which to empower the Hawaiian That's people? Exactly, precisely what I I believe we should be doing. Mm -hmm. So where will OHA go? What, what do you think in terms of its direction? Well, I'm going to leave that for them to decide <laughs> <laughs> at the next year. Uh, and I think they could uh, continue, you know, this mission that um, the current trustees have a passion for. Uh, myself, I don't think we'll ever succeed and that's the and mission. Getting that accepted by the other people in this state. Sure. Until you get the, the rest of the state to accept that, it's not going to go anywhere. So you're calling for OHA to put aside the, the, the mission, as you call it, of right. creating a political mm -hmm. nation right. and pursue more practical economic educational the means economic to advance education, the education, employment, reduce uh, incarceration, 
improve the Hawaiians' health, those things that will make a better, stronger people. You and should be running for OHA again. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to take a break, okay. <laughs> but thank you. My guest is uh, mm -hmm. Uncle Oswald Stender, trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Come back and, <coughs> and be informed by some of the things that he shares as we continue talking about his legacy of stewardship of trust in many institutions here in Hawaii. And in particular, we'll talk about the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I'm Kaylee Akina with the Grassroot Institute, and you're watching Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We'll be right back after this. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Farm Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Farm Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Farm Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Farm Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's, let's go back. We're on the air now. We're going to keep talking about that. Uh, this is Kelii Akina with the Grassroot Institute uh, saying how grateful I am to Jay Fidel and Think Tech Hawaii for the opportunity to host a weekly program called Ehana Kako. We meet with movers and shakers, people who know about what it is to be in Hawaii, and so we hope that you'll you'll tune in regularly. And in addition to that, go to Think Tech Hawaii's website, thinktechhawaii.com, as well as the website of Grassroot Institute, the grassrootinstitute.org, grassroot singular institute.org, and you can watch these broadcasts at any time. We're with Oswald Stender, trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. In his final full year as a trustee, uh, he will not seek re-election. Uh, he has distinguished himself in serving institutions that have done good for Hawaiian people by blood and Hawaiian people at heart. Uh, we were just talking about an often misunderstood issue, the, the Akaka Bill, right, trustee mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stender? And, and this has been an effort uh, sponsored by our senators Akaka and mm -hmm. our late Senator Daniel Inouye, mm -hmm. who uh, really believed in advancing the Hawaiian people. Right. And it started out with some very good intentions, mm -hmm. but somehow got straddled w or with, or saddled, I should mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. with a certain understanding of a nationhood status mm -hmm. that the U.S. government would have a government-to-government -government mm -hmm. relationship with a political mm -hmm. nation. Mm -hmm. and, and you have some thoughts and feelings about what that did to the Akaka Bill. Yeah, I, you know, I kept, I, throughout the whole process, I kept saying that if we remove the issue of governance. Yes. I think the bill could have made it through. In other words, remove the, the, the potential law that we would create a political nation right. with which the United States would right. have a relationship. Right. Let's take the um, recognition issue because that was the throw of the dice. Mm -hmm. Because that whole intention was to build a barrier to protect Hawaiian entitlements. All the federal programs, Alulike, OHA, uh, Liliokalani Trust, Kamehameha Schools, that would have been the vehicle that would have protected the challenges on the 14th Amendment issue. And you're talking about what was embedded in the Statehood Act of 1959, that, right. that the ceded lands, in part, would help the people who belonged to the kingdom prior right. to the United States right. annexation. Right. 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 And so that was your concern. You were hoping a Akaka Bill would at least accomplish that, but you were not in favor at all of the Akaka Bill being used to establish a separate political nation. I, you know, if it could have, but I didn't see it would have. Mm -hmm. So then my thinking was eliminate that to, to do away with that discussion because that was what was confusing everybody. Well, and I think that uh, some people in Washington, D.C. took you seriously, especially when mm -hmm. Senator Inouye removed that yeah. from, from the text <coughs> of the bill. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that part to create a political nation emerged in our state legislature. That's right. And that's yeah. the Kanai Ovalu, the, yeah. Hawaii, yeah. the Native Hawaiian role. Yeah, it kept confusing the issues. Mm. It kept confusing the issues. 
So the Akaka bill was gutted, at least to take out the part that was most onerous, mm -hmm. establishing mm -hmm. a government-to-government -government right. relationship. Right. But when it did that, mm -hmm. our state decided to do that, and, and in. that's mm -hmm. what you call a confusing yeah, issue. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't know what, what you could do about it. Hmm. Well, now that OHA, uh, through your initiative, uh, has agreed no longer to fund it, do you think funding for this Native Hawaiian role is going to come from another quarter? Or, or do you think people no, will try to get that? I'm hopeful that, you know, that it's over. Mm -hmm. That we complete the report as the law required and use that list to form a discussion group to decide where you go from there. Mm. Well, there was a lot of rhetoric with the Native Hawaiian role on the mm -hmm. website and through its media that, that warned people that if they did not sign up, they wouldn't have a stake in being able to determine the future of the Hawaiian people. Well, it's true to an extent, but I don't, I don't, I don't believe that because, mm -hmm. you know, why would we begin a discussion that requires full participation by the Hawaiian people and when they step up and say, I want to participate, and then we're going to say, you can't. Well, I, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that, that uh, uh, I, I heard the threat, and it didn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. Another trustee shared with me the idea that some of the trustees actually believe that OHA does have a mandate that extends beyond merely Hawaiians by blood that by serving the broader community, the whole state, we raise the water level of all people through education, economy, um, and so forth, yeah. and thereby we raise the water level of Hawaiians. Yeah, what are your actually, thoughts about that? We don't have enough money to <laughs> right. help everybody else. I mean, I think we should help the Hawaiians to, to, uh, to solve their issues uh, and improve their quality of life, because once we do that, the quality of life of everyone around us will improve. That's true. And, and I so. would agree with you that if, uh, if we're thinking in terms of entitlements, mm -hmm. there's not enough money to be giving out right. to everyone. But what if we're not thinking just entitlement? Take, for example, the Vianai Coast, mm -hmm. or Nanakuli, mm -hmm. uh, or up through uh, Makaha, mm -hmm. a very depressed economic zone. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, one approach could be to find Hawaiians and give them entitlements, but that doesn't change the coast or the mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. OHA were involved in some economic development that affected the whole coast, it would generate jobs, opportunities for but Hawaiians and Hawaiians all people. Hawaiians could participate mm -hmm. in the jobs and and improve their quality of life, they have to be educated. Yes. So my whole passion is to educate every Hawaiian beyond high school. Now, you had an interesting <coughs> proposal, if we could take a segue here, mm -hmm. uh, when you were a trustee at the Kamehameha Schools mm -hmm. Bishop Estate, looking at, as a businessman, mm -hmm. at the cost of building these oh, yeah. first-class campuses yeah. and the very tiny number of students, relatively, mm -hmm. who could attend them, mm -hmm. You came up with a proposal of saying, look at the wonderful educational opportunities here in the state. Mm -hmm. Punahou, Iolani, mm -hmm. St. Louis, the mm -hmm. Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. What if the Bishop of State Kamehameha schools subcontracted to all of them, <laughs> provided them some funding in order to educate the Hawaiians? There are two ways they could do it cost effective. Mm -hmm. One is you charter all schools within the Hawaiian communities, Waianae, Nanakuli. Uh, all right. Kino, all of them. Because they have high populations of high Native population Hawaiians. High population of Hawaiians. And that, to me, is the most cost effective. Rather than building these edifices that they've built around the state, beautiful buildings. Sure. And the grounds are beautiful. But all the money is going into capital improvements, where well, that money should be going to education. Mm -hmm. That's one problem. All right. The other, why not give the Hawaiian same opportunity to go to Punahou, to go to Iolani, because I worked it out one time that I used to sit on the board of the Iolani School and to educate at that time, which was like 20 years ago, uh, it took $14,000 to educate a student at Iolani. At Kamehameha, it took 17000 The tuition at Iolani at the time was 8000 So you could, for every student, you could put two kids at Kamehameha into Aerolani, right. and Aerolani would subsidize each of them by $4,000. And we at OHA did start that program where we funded 
uh, kids that want to go to Puno and Eola. Well, you know, this is brilliant free market thinking <laughs> in it's a sense. economics. <laughs> and, and I love it because it's coming from you as an entrepreneur, as a businessman mm -hmm. who looks at the costs mm -hmm. and looks at the ultimate outcome that you want mm -hmm. instead of looking at institutions. That's and, right. and exactly. Well, you know, I hope you caught the last three minutes with Trustee Oswald Stender. If not, go back and play it again. <laughs> because you heard a brilliant solution to a problem that has plagued the Hawaiian people, that there's just yeah. not enough entitlement money to build big campuses for schools like Kamehameha. Yeah. Uh, they do very good, but with some market thinking, uh, we could come up with solutions that meet the needs of many. I'm mm -hmm. Kili Akina with the Grassroot Institute. We're talking with Office of Hawaiian Affairs Trustee Oswald Stender. You're watching Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Come back for our final segment in just a minute. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number no. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Horry. Mahalo. Just do the numbers. Absolutely. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. Every week we're here as part of the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. And you know we've been talking with trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Oswald Stender. Uh, before we wrap up today's program, I hope you realize how precious our time has been with him. There have been some views that have been expressed that aren't readily available in the news media. Uh, Uncle Oz has been a real fighter for a new perspective and uh, some of his ideas I think are well worth running with. Uh, for example, bringing free market ideas to and competition to education so that we can actually use the money better to reach out to the Hawaiian population and to everyone in the state. Well, I want to close with a, and another important question. In the years to come, we're going to see the Office of Hawaiian Affairs grow in its wealth. Mm -hmm. and in its influence in society. Mm -hmm. uh, the elections for trustee are now mm -hmm. taking uh, notice um, amongst a much broader population. Right. Mm -hmm. The asset base has grown. You've been mm -hmm. the chair of the committee that deals yeah. with the asset management. And people ha have come to realize that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is now a landowner, 13th uh, yeah. largest landowner in the state and rising up yeah. that ladder uh, with the acquisition mm -hmm. of a very notable piece of property mm -hmm. in central Honolulu, the mm -hmm. Kaka'ako waterfront, uh, yeah. the 30 acres there. What are your thoughts about the growing power and growing land mass, the land base of the well, Office of Hawaiian yeah, Affairs? You know, if you look at, uh, what was it, balance sheet, you know, we're a $600 million net worth company. And over there, we've got $400 million in cash. So it brings great resources to the, to the entity. It would usually make you a takeover target. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. And Kaka'ako had a great opportunity. Um, I think we did some quick numbers that show that it could generate 20 to $30 million a year income. Mm -hmm. uh, the And I hope that that project moves forward without having to wrestle with uh, government issues. We're a government agency and we need to uh, move based on sunshine laws, which, sure. which is not appropriate for doing real estate. Well, how do you deal with the public relations question mm -hmm. of how fair is it that the Office of Wine Affairs focus on one ethnic group with its assets and resources mm -hmm. in a land in which we have generally valued inclusiveness and, and, and aloha. And, well, and maybe part of the, the issue is... You have to begin mm -hmm. with the history. Okay. All of these lands belonged to the Hawaiian people at one time. It was stolen. It really was. You know, people keep making a joke of it, but it really was. The lands were taken from the people illegally. Well, it was, ille it was legal, but I mean, you look at the apology resolution by the United States Congress, they admit that the overthrow was illegal. If the overthrow was illegal, 
that all the land that was ceded to the United States that was taken illegally should be returned. So in other words, happen. what would justify present day actions mm -hmm. is a reading of history. Right. And, okay. and, a, and reading a history that says an injustice was performed that mm -hmm. needs to be righted. Mm -hmm. there, there's some questions that many have raised about it, of course, mm -hmm. uh, such mm -hmm. as the fact that weren't a good number of the population of the Kingdom of Hawaii not necessarily native Hawaiians, that from the time True. of Kamehameha on, mm -hmm. through the Ookalani, right. we had Caucasian, Japanese, right. Chinese, mm -hmm. Filipino, large mm -hmm. segments of the population who were right. loyalists to, right. to, to the crown. Right. Do you think that, that their needs and, and the needs of their, their oh. descendants should factor into some kind of uh, no, use of the land? No, because still the land belonged to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Didn't belong to any foreign person. Didn't belong to anyone who became a citizen under the republic. The land still belonged to the kingdom. Now, when I read the 1840 Constitution, I, I see a remarkable thing done by the elite right. or the monarchs of the yeah. Hawaiian people. And, and, and that was to to move toward the rights of individuals and, and right. property rights they and preach all of that. Yes, but the fact was, it took away the right of Hawaiians to vote. Because it said, in order to vote, you have to have money, you have to have land. I want to say none of that. So you have to speak English. No didn't speak I English. I see. Yeah. So when you were speaking earlier, also the land being taken away from the, mm -hmm. the people per se, mm -hmm. you, you're not talking only about something that may have happened post annexation, but even before oh, that, before that yeah. under yeah. the Hawaiian kingdom, right. we have a problem. Right. of the land being taken away from the people right. or the intentions of the land distribution in the Great Mahele, okay. the Great Mahele you not getting that. into the hands of the people. Right. Now with that said then, and I think mm -hmm. it's a very important thing to clarify, mm -hmm. the search for justice then isn't something that has to be aimed against United States per se. No. It, it's What you're saying is that the search for justice goes to here is the land, here are the people. Right. Let's set something right about that. Right. Well, you know, Uncle Oz, that uh, as you and I had talked this year, I had the wonderful opportunity of becoming part of the Grassroot Institute mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have the privileged role of mm -hmm. helping to shape mm -hmm. the way that institution yeah. helps mm -hmm. to advance Hawaiians yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And I see a wonderful relationship between the value in the United mm -hmm. States of property rights of individuals. Right. Right and when education comes to these individuals right. and opportunities mm -hmm. uh, we have a strong individual and so when I look at this situation I think it's not easy it's not 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 clean it's to not, separate it's, parties you know, it's a very difficult you know problem. right but if we but, look to values mm -hmm. the values of the 1840 Constitution mm -hmm. of Hawaii yeah. and the Constitution of the US we may find that values can pull us out of it what are your thoughts right. about that the whole Constitution was contrived, mm -hmm. uh, the Mahele was contrived, uh, the kingdom was influenced by the colonists to do certain things which then opened the door for them, and that's what happened. Well, on, on one hand, <coughs> I, I think that history is something that, that needs good research and, and competitive voices. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to bring forth and mm -hmm. you know I've spent a lot of my time yeah. trying to sort through sources and yeah. so forth uh, do you think that there's a certain point at which we may not be able to come to a consensus about all of the history yeah, and you won't you and so that. you being the practical man mm -hmm. and we only have a couple minutes left to solve the problems of to Hawaii do the best you can with what you got <laughs> that's right you'll never fix it what do, would you, if you what would be your prescription if they, if they made you a Lee Nui the well, what are we doing <laughs> the now? Try to negotiate the best deal we can because that's the only place you got to go and and do you think that that's a more fruitful path for moving that's forward the only path the only path yeah because you're not going to get it back nobody's going to give it to you you don't have enough money to buy it so you need to negotiate out what you can get mm. so then in that case th this might be you counsel, parting counsel by you for what the role the Office of Hawaiian Affairs might play, mm -hmm. as opposed to taking a strong yeah. militant stand on nationhood. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. they should. Th perhaps you're saying to the the trustees to consider negotiating the, the best relationship and settle the Cedar Land issue. It's mm -hmm. not settled. We need to get back to that. 
you know that's that's where it all ends yeah. so without settling it we'll still be floundering I appreciate so much the fact that we've been able to talk in a slow fashion mm -hmm. uh, and hear some of the intertwining threads mm -hmm. and we've just scratched the surface really yeah well uh, for me I, I feel bad that most of what is understood about these issues because it doesn't fit on bumper stickers <laughs> is, is, is hijacked talk about politically it. Talk about it. it needs to be discussed uh -huh. yes you know? and I was hopeful at one time you know that grassroots and and it doesn't have to be OHA, any respectable Hawaiian group, to talk about the issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you'll join me in creating that conversation. Yeah, I will. Well, I mm -hmm. thank you, and I want to okay. thank you, Uncle Oz. Yeah. Uh, I respect you, love you, mm -hmm. and thank you for what you've done for all people here mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman, Trustee Oswald Stender of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, uh, has served the community so well in so many capacities. Uh, whether you agree with everything he says or not, I hope that you understand what his heart has been for all people of Hawaii and for his own native Hawaiian population. I am Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute and want you to know that we want with all our heart to bring Hawaii's people together or be part of the process of bringing Hawaii's people together for a better government, a better economy, a better society. That's why we say ehana kako, let's work together. And as we work together, we can find solutions that are for the greater good. I hope you'll join us again on the next episode of ehana kako. Until then, thanks to Jay Fidel and the Think Tech Hawaii crew. Much aloha and mahalo. <laughs>